Good morning, everyone, and welcome to an interested persons meeting being hosted by the Ethics Commission staff today, Thursday, March 18th, 2020, at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. In conformity with the Governor's Executive Order N2920, and due to concerns over COVID-19, this special meeting will be accessible telephonically. The live audio for this meeting may be heard by calling 213-621-2489. Public comments may be provided by email to ethics.commission at lacity.org or verbally during item two on this agenda by calling area code number 669-254-5252. Enter meeting ID number 160-300-7558, followed by pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant's ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to speak. With that said, I'll be calling this meeting to order and beginning with introductions and a bit of background. My name is Nancy Jackson and I'm the Director of Strategic Communications at the Ethics Commission. We are being joined today by Commission President Melinda Murray and our Policy Director, Tyler Joseph. If any other commissioners are present, please feel free to introduce yourselves at this time. Hearing none, we'll go ahead and get started. The purpose of this special meeting is to solicit public comments specifically from the Business Improvement District community on the city's lobbying laws and the 2018 recommendations. To provide a bit of background, in 2018, the Ethics Commission recommended that the City Council adopt a comprehensive set of updates on the city's lobbying laws as the Los Angeles Municipal Lobbying Ordinance had not been thoroughly updated since 1994. The Ethics Commission spent two years conducting research and analyzing laws around the country. The Ethics Commission also extensively engaged the public during the review. Feedback was solicited and provided at five public commission meetings, five interested persons meetings, and four meetings with groups representing more than 65 neighborhood councils. The Ethics Commission also sent multiple emails to its more than 8,500 subscribers and created a page on its website to solicit public input. Because no legislative action was taken on the 2018 recommendations, they expired in March of 2020. At its December 2020 meeting, the Ethics Commission expressed an interest in the possibility of a new set of lobbying recommendations and asked staff to solicit additional feedback from the public and the regulated communities. Staff held three such meetings this January to ensure adequate representation from the business improvement district bid community. Staff was asked to hold this additional meeting. Bid community, we encourage your participation. The Ethics Commission would like to hear from you. So please tell us what you think about the 2018 recommendations and or how the city's lobbying laws apply to you. You may provide public comment here today via this Zoom meeting or on the Ethics Commission's website at ethics.lacity.org slash policy or by emailing us at ethics.policy at lacity.org. If you would like to comment here today, you may virtually raise your hand to speak by dialing star nine on your phone. We'll be taking comments in the order in which speakers raise their hands. You may go ahead and start doing that now to get in the queue. Again, that's star nine to raise your hand to speak. But before we open it up for comments, I'll be turning it over to the Ethics Commission's Policy Director, Tyler Joseph, who will be providing additional guidance for item two on our agenda. Tyler. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so, hi everyone, my name is Tyler Joseph. I'm the Policy Director with the Ethics Commission. First off, we just wanted to say thanks to everyone who's taken the time to be here today to help us learn a little bit more about the business improvement districts, what they do, how they operate. As Nancy mentioned, we're going to start by opening up the floor for any prepared statements that callers want to make. So if you'll just raise your hand, we'll call on you and we will move down the list until everyone who wants to speak has had a chance. And then after that, we have a couple of questions that we would like to ask everyone on the call. So we'll ask those one at a time and anyone who wants to raise their hand to weigh in will be able to do that. So 
We'll start with the prepared statements. Uh, anyone who wants to speak, just go ahead and raise your hand and Nancy will start to call on you. Thanks very much. And I do see uh, some raised hands here. So we'll go ahead and start with caller with phone number ending in 147. Caller with phone number ending in 147. If you can please dial star six to unmute and go ahead and state your name for the record. Yes, if you can hi. Spell it for us, that would be helpful too. Excuse me. Sure, sure. Can you all hear me? Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ellen Riotto. That's uh, R I O T T O. And I am the executive director of the South Park bid in downtown. Um, I want to say thanks for this opportunity to share more about what we do. Um, and yeah, I'll just jump right in. Our request is to exempt bids, except as it relates to proposed real estate development projects in our districts. So bids are different from other entities that are regulated by the Ethics Commission in that we are contractually obligated to provide specific supplemental services to our neighborhoods. And those contracts are formed with the city of Los Angeles. What happens in reality though, is that when a bid is formed, the city often backs off from providing their services and tasks like the maintenance of public trash cans are left entirely to the business improvement district. So for example, our bid has more than 200 trash cans throughout our neighborhood and our bid ambassadors are the only ones that are servicing all of them. Another example is that street sweeping um, occurs only after very large events because our team is clearing the curb lines, the sidewalks, and the tree wells of debris and litter every single day. So the language of these contracts, which are with the city directly, as I mentioned, quite literally require us to act as a liaison with the city. That is language that is included in those contracts. And there are some issues that the bid is simply not equipped to handle. So up until last year, LA Sanitation had hired a, had a hired position uh, for a bid liaison. And bids were encouraged to communicate directly with that staff person on issues like illegal dumping and hazardous waste in the public right of way. So to create a point person and then require bids to track all communication, every call, every email, every in-person encounter, is counter to the intent of creating that position in the first place. Further, many of the communications that, uh, excuse me, many of the communications are required because systems that the city sets up for the public are glitchy or ineffective, and bids are used by the city as pilots and partners to work through those glitches. So for example, 311 is sort of a catch-all for service requ requests from the city, but many times a 311 request is made and the request is marked as resolved, but no action has been taken and there's been no reason given for the inaction. And so in these cases, it's necessary for the bid to engage directly with the city to determine the root of the problem. Furthermore, city employees routinely seek information and data from bids and request our assistance in outreach efforts. These city employees understand the value of the relationship that the bid has established for the community and leverages it to carry out their own initiatives. In other words, the liaison role is mutually beneficial and it should be noted that lobbying laws in other jurisdictions like San Francisco, San Diego, Orange County, exempt responding to requests from the government. So clearly it would not only be burdensome, but nearly impossible for a bid to satisfy the requirements of the contract without frequent communication with the city. Forcing bids to spend hours documenting their interactions with city employees would necessarily result in less resources towards providing municipal services to the community. The government's interest in this information, which is already a matter of public record, does not remotely outweigh the burden it places on bids, the communities that bids serve, and the city at large. Thank you again. Thank you for your comment. If we can hear from our next caller now, uh, phone number ending in 438. Phone number ending in 438. If you can please dial star six to unmute, then state your name for the record. If you can spell your name as well, that would be helpful. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, all. My name is Anthony Rodriguez, A N T H O N Y R O D R I G U E Z. I am the Director of Operations for the Los Angeles Fashion District. The, bid, the goal of the bid is to provide supplemental services that the city is unable to offer at a higher level or in detail. The bid I represent covers 107 blocks of, the, of downtown Los Angeles in which we offer public safety and street cleaning services to. We collect about 13,000 pounds of trash a day from the public right of way. We cover thousands of square feet of graffiti a year and wash over 16 million feet of public sidewalk in one year. Our security teams respond to hundreds of service calls a year from our local community members. In order to effectively meet the expectations of the community and help improve our Los Angeles, we heavily rely and interact with the city agencies. In no part do my interactions with any staff member of the city or any agency is to solicit a service they're not already responsible for. My communications with the city agencies are to seek support and ensure that the area receives the municipal services they should be receiving already. The same way that we, we contact the city for services, the city's agencies rely on us as well for assistance. We continuously assist LA Sanitation in collecting large amounts of trash from specific areas. We're relied on by CD14 and the Bureau of Street Lighting to map out locations of street lights that require service or repair. We assist LASA and other county service providers in locating homeless people that are, they need to contact initially for, initially for services or for some type of follow-up information. And as of recent, we were contact, we were invited by LAPD to be at the city's emergency command post um, during the preparations for the, any civil unrest that may have occurred during election day because LAPD recognizes that our capability of communicating and streamlining those communications for any events or activities that are happening within our communities. I do not ask any city employee or agency for anything that is not, that they're not already responsible for. I do not ask for any concessions because of how often I contact a city agency and city employees, which is multiple times every day Having to lock each interaction, each conversation would not allow time for me to do any other duty but to report this. By adding additional obstacles on how we operate and how we, we work with the city agencies is only going to affect the community, a community which is already suffering um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and rely on our services even more so. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time and your comment, Mr. Rodriguez. If we can now hear from the next caller, please, uh, if you can uh, please dial star six to unmute caller with phone number ending in 829. Phone number ending in 829. If you can please dial star six to unmute, state your name for the record and please spell it for us if possible. Thank you. Hi, thank you. This is Blair Beston, B-L-A-I-R-B-E-S-T-E-N. I'm the Executive Director of the Historic Core Business Improvement District. Um, thank you all for hearing more in depth about us. Um, I think through this conversation, you'll, you'll get, gain an understanding that we are unique and hopefully we can further clarify our work. I know that there'll be a lot of repetition here, but hopefully um, it'll be clarified in a way that makes sense on, on some level. Um, we're governed by both a management district plan as voted on by property owners in a district. And we work day to day according to an ex executed contract with the city of LA, which you know I know you, you know now. Um, the city clerk administrates, it has oversight over our work. Our board meetings are open to the public by Brown Act laws. We also have our correspondence subject to California Public Records Act. Um, this Correspondence is not only requested by the CPRA of us, but also of literally every department that we communicate with. So essentially our communications are able to be transparent from both sides. Um, this is several layers of transparency that don't exist for most lobbyists. Um, we're also required to report regularly our activities 
present budgets. We have our own portal through the City of LA to access our numbers and these reports. Our contract states, um, and I quote, we supplement services not only that would not be performed by the city, but Ms. the interests of- yes. Ms. Besting, I'm sorry, you cut off after you said your communications will be. I'm not sure where oh. you were in your comment, but oh, you got cut off for about 30 It minutes. might just be my, okay, sorry about that. Um, let's see, our communications that are, uh, did you hear about the CPRA and that the, basically our communications have to be transparent from both sides because the, they can be requested, CPRA can be requested by both the city side and also of us. So it's several layers of transparency that don't exist for most lobbyists. Is that where I left off? Yes, please go ahead and can continue. Yes, okay. we can. Thank you. Um, we also present budgets and, and have to report regularly on our activities, which are posted through a portal through the city of LA, which can access our numbers and reports. Um, our contract states that, and I'm quoting, uh, supplement, we supplement services not only that would not be performed by the city, but the interests of the city are better served by an agreement with the corporation. Um, these districts were deemed so necessary, they were enacted into state law. And that ability was created years ago, but the need for our services is real. These Partnerships are made between city and, and nonprofits all over the world, and other cities recognize these functions and have exempted bids from lobbying laws, such as Long Beach. Also, as a function of our contract with the city, we're obligated to be a community liaison. I mean, that's the word they use. And what does that look like if we're fulfilling that directive as a function of our contract? Communities such as mine, and others are, most others are incredibly diverse. We support tourism, small businesses, residents, as well as property owners that voted to assess themselves additionally to provide these services. And the availability of us to the communities and our requirements to serve the area require regular correspondence with city departments in order to do so. This is uh, serving a particular area, yes, but I would argue that because we're taking services off of the city's plate, they should be able to better serve the underserved areas that do not have bids. Um, we literally respond to thousands of calls a year that LAPD does not. When there was a call to defund the police, it's quite literally services such as ours that pick up the slack for low-level radio calls like sick persons, disturbances, and incidents where de-escalation can resolve the issue. Most recently, uh, as Anthony mentioned, during the civil unrest, we were asked, um, and specifically some of us, to keep department informed of issues of, of violence and property damage or arson. Um, literally, the police weren't able to be in all the areas exp experiencing the issues, but we were the ones calling in, reporting the fires. We were the ones calling the tenants to tell them their stores were being looted. Um, we are also asked to distribute crime awareness and prevention flyers by the police to reduce crimes of opportunity. Um, and, and as been men mentioned, we provide composite lists of, of lighting out outages in our areas. We work with sanitation on habitual issues of illegal dumping. And when those responses are not possible by the city, we haul these items away in a more timely fashion so they don't clutter up the public realm. Um, again, all this requires communication and coordination, and this is our day-to-day. -day. Um, we're asked by our elected officials to weigh in on certain issues, such as scooters or their impact to communities, and this is requested by the city to us, and they ask us because we're out there every day observing, reporting, and serving. Um, and also, as was mentioned, you know, if we had to document these actions communicating with the city, we'd be repeating our jobs twice each day. Uh, once to communicate and once to document. And I'm not sure any of us have this much time given the demands placed on us by the con current conditions on our streets. Um, I'd also ask what other city contractors are required to document their interactions with city departments and are asked to represent themselves as lobbyists. Um, we have layers of both transparency and regulation. So I just urge you to consider us as the unique body that we are. And I, I hope you were able to hear all that. <laughs> Thank you.
Yes, we heard you, Ms. Besting. Thank you for your comment. If we can now hear from caller with phone number ending in 403. Caller with phone number ending in 403, if you can please dial star six to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. If you can also spell that for us, it would be helpful. Thank you. Hi, this is Lauren Lappin, L-O-R-I-N, L-A-P-P-I-N. And I am representing the Hollywood Partnership, managing entity of the Hollywood Entertainment District bid. As the business and finance manager, my position plays a critical role in ensuring our organization is adhering to the corporation responsibilities stated in the contract with the city of Los Angeles. These responsibilities include the preparation and submission of various documents to the city clerk's office, including the quarterly and annual activity reports, a full disclosure financial statement with a certified public, re public accountant's review and the annual budget. One of the main responsibilities I will discuss is the annual assessment preparation and subsequent assessment billing. This requires frequent communication with the city clerk's office. Each year we are responsible for submitting to the city clerk the assessment data to be placed on the county assessor tax roll for the following tax year. This process requires many interactions with the city clerk's team in order to submit the correct information to the county assessor. Each parcel in our district, which for this tax year we have almost 1,000, is assessed using a calculation of land area, street front footage, and building square footage. Throughout the year, parcel changes from the assessor's office can occur, which we are responsible for submitting any corrections or adjustments during the preparation. The annual assessment process requires accuracy by our organization with the approval from the city clerk's office, therefore requiring constant and iterative communication between us and the city to ensure the correct information is relayed between both parties. Once the collection of the annual assessments begins, as part of the fiduciary duties of the organization, my role is to track the revenue collection by the county as well as the invoices directly billed by the city clerk's office. This is an important task in order to project our cash flows and ensure there is no disruption to services in our district. Throughout the year, there can be multiple occasions in reaching out to the city clerk's office for payment or follow-up status. For instance, communication with our project coordinator has increased due to a system delay at the city clerk's office for the invoicing of the direct billing. And since the beginning of 2021, I have communicated with the project coordinator and team several times each week for the status of the direct bill issue, uh, parcel discrepancies on our county payment reports, and information on revenue payments. And thank you for your time. Thank you for your time as well, Ms. Lappin, and for your comment. I did want to mention that we're also being joined by Commissioner Dar. Welcome to Commissioner Dar. And I would like to hand it over to Tyler briefly for a comment. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick point of clarification. Um, so we've heard from multiple bids, not just today, but since we started this process, that the interactions they have with the city employees relate almost exclusively to ministerial activity. I think it was Mr. Rodriguez from the Fashion District who said that he never asks for things that the city isn't already required to do. Um, things like trash collection, connecting members with city services, those get mentioned a lot. So I just want to reiterate that that is not lobbying activity. Purely ministerial activity like that will not trigger lobbying registration requirements. Um, from what we've heard, this seems to be a major concern for the bid community, but we want to be clear that that type of thing is not lobbying activity, nor is it something we're looking to regulate or ask you to keep track of. So if you see that something has been you know, illegally dumped in the street and you call the city to take care of it, we are not, nor are we ever planning to ask you to log that type of activity and add all this administrative burden to your day-to-day -day activity. So we just want to clarify that that sort of ministerial interaction with the city um, is not lobbying activity. So hand it back over to you, Nancy, to uh, hear for some more callers. Thanks. Thank you for clarifying that, Tyler. 
if we can now hear from caller with phone number ending in 208. Caller with phone number ending in 208, if you can go ahead and unmute by dialing star six. And if you can state your name for the record and spell it for us, that would be helpful. Thank you. Hi, uh, it's Rob Kwan, um, R-O-B-Q-U-A-N. And- uh, Welcome, Mr. Kwan, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I just want to ask you a, a question for, for the commission and everybody listening. Uh, over the last year, have you ever had any concerns about policing, treatment of the unhoused, gentrification, inequity in the city, or how special, influence, special interests influence development? Well, if you do, you should be concerned about bids. Um, I think a perfect case study for, you know, <laughs> what can go wrong here is George Yu and the Chinatown bid. Uh, you can go search online and find accounts of him his security forces intimidating, verbally assaulting, and berating um, unhoused members. Um, George Yu and his security forces have actually been found to deploy outside of their jurisdiction and outside of the boundaries of the bid. Uh, last year, a warrant was actually issued for George Yu after a judge found him contempt of court for failure to turn over public records related his attempts to conspire to block the formation of the Skid Row Neighborhood Council. Um, connections to City Hall run deep beyond contributions. Months before that uh, warrant was issued, uh, the plum chair, Marquise Harris Dawson, paid George Yu to host a fundraiser for him. The year prior, Jose Huizar, then the plum chair, uh, paid Yu to host a fundraiser for him. Um, if bids cared about the community there, why didn't they help, um, you know, the grocery store that was getting nudged out of Chinatown that elderly residents relied upon, the last grocery store there? Uh, why did he ask the DO to strip the affordable housing uh, insured by the planning commission that they negotiated for the development of at, the, at the college station? Um, there's a lot of talk here about uh, bids just doing good things. And, you know, there are no way like our neighborhood councils. Uh, those are all volunteers. Um, bids are undemocratic institutions. Votes to form the bids are based upon property rights. The number of votes you get is based upon property rights. Uh, the city actually votes by default to join the bids. So it's really just a rigged game for a lot of these local communities that are forced to be enrolled in these bids. And then the, these ex extractive institutions force people who didn't vote to them for, to form the bid to pay taxes there. The city actually is paying taxes into the bids. So that's money diverted from other potential ways the city could be uh, deploying those resources. Um, we spent years and wasted tens of thousands of dollars in taxpayer money trying to hold these bids accountable. Um, <laughs> you know, that we've had lawsuits that we're paying for with taxpayer money, defending the bid because they don't want to be accountable to the Brown Act and the California Public Records Act request. They all loathe the blogger Adrian Riskin for his relentless efforts to ensure they actually follow the law. Uh, they still try to evade these requirements and make it extremely difficult to get any of these records. Uh, you don't get credit for following laws that you never wanted to follow. Um, they simply ensure that our elected officials do the bidding of business. They are well-resourced institutions who employ people to be liaisons between special interests and the government. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a lobbyist to me. Uh, I appreciate your time. want to make sure some bids can get in here, but I wanted to provide a little bit of balance. And I hope you do actually look into exactly how they deploy their resources, what kind of communities are marginalized, and consider that in all of this. Thank you. Thank you for your time as well as your comment, Mr. Kwan. If we can hear now from caller with phone number ending in 599. Caller with phone number ending 599. If you can please state your name for the record and spell it for us as well, that would be helpful. Thank you. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Go ahead. Terrific. Thank you. I am Suzanne Holly, H O L L E Y, and I'm the president and the CEO of the Downtown Center Business Improvement District, or the DC BID. The DC BID is comprised of 65 square blocks in the Central Business District of Downtown Los Angeles. Thank you very much for your consideration in providing this interested persons meeting specifically for business improvement districts um, or bids, uh, as we're more commonly known. The role of bids is, is very unique, and the actions this commission takes has the potential to have very substantial and long-term impacts on the ability of 
for bids to do the work that taxpayers pay them to do. Um, as you know, the bid community became very concerned that many of our actions could be viewed as lobbying when we received uh, the flyer from the Ethics Commission through the City Clerk's Office in July of last year. In that flyer, it was noted that an interaction with the city could be considered lobbying if it included an attempt to influence city action. This description is so broad, you know, as it pertains to the bids, that it could be applied to almost any communication we have. And I, I very, very much appreciate Tyler's comments earlier in this call and, you know, comments made in an earlier call that it, it is not the desire uh, of the commission to, to, to designate the, the ministerial or day-to-day -day activities of, of bids as lobbying. But that, that was not clear from the communication. And, and we're not lobbyists. Um, and so these are not evaluations that, that we, we make on a day-to-day day -day basis. We are different than any other organization that is subject to ethics regulations. So I think that the Ethics Commission needs to look at us through a different lens. And again, it's not that I don't believe you that you know uh, the, our day-to-day -day actions will not be subject to this, but without some very, very clear guidelines that they're not, it's very difficult for, for us to manage to that. So that's really, you know, the thrust of our request here is for clarity on exactly, you know, what you, you will consider lobbying. And, you know, we, we provided in our letter to you, you know, a recommendation on, on that. And, and, and we really, we need, you know, a further definition of, um, you know, in, uh, uh, hold on, just attempting, to influence city action. And, and, you know, the reason why I think, you know, we need different instruction is because we are different than any other organization that you regulate. You know, we're formed by state law. In the state law, it says that we're formed in the public interest. We are not hired by private entities. Um, the state law, law requires us to contract with the city. It doesn't make sense for us to work with the city and then require us to report on our interactions with the city. And, and, and yes, many of those interactions do have to do with, you know, p picking up trash or graffiti. But, you know, in, in our role as liaison with the community, um, the, the city can ask us for information and then actions could be taken based on that communication. LADOT will will reach out to us and ask us for stakeholder you know input on some improvements and what if LADOT decides to move a bike lane or move um, a loading zone based on that interaction then is, is that lobbying so the lines are fuzzy and you know I, I appreciate that it seem it may seem like a clear cut definition to say that ministerial actions are not subject to that, but it, it really is not, you know, that clear. So to just kind of give it, a, you know, that, that broad definition, it, it is very difficult for us to imagine. We, we have uh, managed, we have thousands and thousands of communications. And I, I said, my employees aren't lobbyists, so they, they don't know how to, how to make, you know, these, you know, evaluations. And, and that, that's really, what we are looking for assistance um, from the commission with with today is clarification, refinement, and definition. I think I think that um, would be you know helpful to you. It would definitely be helpful for us, and you know it would help us then to reserve our resources for what you know taxpayers you know pay us to do. So I thank you thank you very much um, for your consideration today. Ms. Holly, thank you for your comment. Caller with phone number ending in 586. You have the floor. Phone number ending in 586. If you can please dial star six to unmute. And state your name for the record. If you can spell that for us as well, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is Cheryl Branch. 
and I am the manager for the Greater Lamar Park Village Crenshaw Corridor bid. And um, I'd like to, you've heard everything from my colleagues and one of our critics. Um, what I'd like to speak about is the smaller bids. Um, we are a small bid. We collect less than $300,000 a year annually in tax assessments. And we also are located in um, one of the marginalized communities with a lot of um, lower income adults um, and seniors and just a lot of dilapidated disinvestment over several decades. So the formation and the operation of our business improvement district is, is really critical, life and death. We have one of the highest concentrations of visible homelessness and tents and encampments, and um, we do not um, move them and treat them inhumanely. We are well known for being very careful um, with our homeless populations, our power washing teams. Um, even we have little notices that you receive, like from your utility company that we created and that we let tents and, and visible homeless um, on the streets know that, you know, next Tuesday, next Wednesday, we'll be power washing the east side or the west side of the street, and we give them an opportunity to move. And I don't know a lot of other groups that, that take that kind of care. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that, that we are absolutely a public-private partnership with the city of L.A., um, there is no way that they have the resources, the time, the manpower to be flexible, pivot, respond to the level of bulky, illegal dumping that happens in our area. It is literally overwhelming. The cost for um, sanitation and hygiene exceeds the bid assessments, and so regularly we are in a position where our board um, has to decide why are we subsidizing, you know, some of these public services and resources. So what the role that our property owners took by voting this in was to join the city and be stakeholders in solving um, these larger issues. We do not get involved in um, development issues. So there may be some bad actors. I'm not familiar with them. But we don't want you to make a decision based on one or two bad actors and throw out the baby with the bathwater. Our business improvement district team was essential in helping our smaller property owners, small business owners to survive during this COVID um, pandemic we've had in the 12 months. We made over 12,000 care calls during that time to our big community, the stakeholders to check on families, to make sure that businesses knew how to access resources and other um, lifelines that the city, the state, the federal government um, was making available. And if not for the bid team and the property owners voting to allow us to do that kind of outreach, I don't know what would have happened in some of these um, income areas where we work. Um, we were relied upon to distribute um, accurate, reliable information. We work hand in hand with LAPD um, to minimize the safety concerns, violence, um, car thefts and robberies because that just is routine in those lower income areas. So the property owners, they depend on us to be that liaison because LAPD, LAFD, you may not know this, but they're slow coming to 90008, 90056. They're slow to come to those communities. We work very closely with our neighborhood councils. And so we don't have these kinds of issues where it's neighborhood council versus the bid. Um, we support the art and culture, especially the healing arts were very um, prominent during this um, COVID period to help um, get that kind of information and opportunity out for those that come to our community. The street vending is another big issue, uh, um, activities and issues that happen in our bid, that the bid is very active to make sure permits and parking um, and the congestion that happens. They call us. They don't call the city. 
Um, and we don't even have time to talk to the city besides getting our annual quarterly reports in because we spend our days handling these health and safety, hygiene, homeless um, issues, clean and safe. And so I just wanted to speak up for the smaller bids. We're, we're all not large, multi-million dollar higher end neighborhoods of Los Angeles. Some of us have used this public-private partnership opportunity following all the letter of the law to make decisions and try to make our neighborhoods a better place to live, work, play, worship. And we hope that the Ethics Commission will follow our suggestions and recommendations today. We are the unicorns. We are not lobbyists. Thank you. Ms. Branch, thank you for taking the time to speak up for your community and for your bid. Caller with phone number ending in 816. 816, if you can please dial star six to unmute and state your name for the record. If you can spell your name, that would also be helpful. Thank you. Sure thing, and, and, and good afternoon. My name is Chris Larson, that's K-R-I-S-L-A-R-S-O-N. And I am the president and CEO of the Hollywood Partnership. Um, I work with Lauren, uh, who, who spoke earlier. Um, and I have had a chance to address this commission a, a few times in the past to talk about our work in Hollywood. Um, and today I wanted to quote directly from a, a 2017 paper, which was published by the League of California Cities regarding bids. Uh, and it was written to help to advise city attorneys in communities considering the formation of a bid. A, bid, a business improvement district is a program of a city under which the city levies an assessment against businesses or property to fund services or improvements that benefit the assessed businesses or property. The program of services, improvements, and assessments are described in documents such as a management district plan created during the establishment process. Cities can create bids so that the services and improvements are provided directly by the city. However, it is much more common for services and improvements to be provided either by an existing nonprofit organization or by a non nonprofit formed by bid proponents specifically to serve the bid. Such a nonprofit is often referred to as an owner's association. So you may hear, hear that term um, used interchangeably about our boards. Cities find bids attractive because with minimal invest investment of general fund tax dollars, a bid can help enliven up an aging commercial area ideally leading to increased civic pride, economic development, and increased tax revenue for the city. A city council can only establish a bid after the owners of the businesses or property have indicated their support for the bid via a petition, a ballot, or both. Um, and most of the bid directors on this call can reflect on really the campaign that is involved, oftentimes more than a year involved in being able to generate that satisfactory level of support. Uh, to ensure that city councils do not find themselves on the wrong end of a political decision involving the formation of a bid. Services and improvements are generally provided by the nonprofit organization, which is under contract to the city. The Owners Association also generally prepares an annual report, which is used by the city as a basis for annual decision making. Two statutes authorize the establishment of bids. Uh, the first is the Parking and Business Improvement Area Law of 1989. And the second is the Property and Business Improvement District Law of 94. Bids governed by the 89 law are funded by assessments against businesses, whereas bids governed by the 94 law can be funded by assessments on businesses, assessments on property, or a combination of the two types of assessments. And in Los Angeles, where bids have existed since 1994, uh, the most common is going to be the property-based improvement district. All cities do have the authority to utilize their choice of the 89 or 94 law, however. The term business improvement district is commonly used to refer to all bids, whether created under the 89 law, the 94 law, or a typical charter city procedural ordinance. Bids are not entities that have a separate legal existence from the cities that establish them, nor are bids political subdivisions that have independent governing boards. Instead, a bid is a form of an assessment district, not unlike assessment districts formed under the Landscaping and Lighting Act of 1972 or the Benefit Assessment Act of 1982. Um, and I say all of this to really sort of circle back to a point that I made in my previous comments to this commission regarding our role as a creature of and partner to the city. 
Um, we are linked in so many ways that, that really uh, stretch from the day-to-day uh, that we've heard from some of, of our counterparts today, uh, between garbage to economic development to other systemic challenges in our communities. Um, and, and we are truly working with one another uh, to help to improve the communities that we serve. Um, and, and knowing most of, of my counterparts on this call, um, we are all strong in heart and mind. Uh, we love our communities, um, and we do the best every day we can uh, to help them move forward. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Mr. Larson, thank you for your time as well and for speaking on behalf of your community and your district as well as the others. At this time, I would like to invite caller with phone number ending in 803 to speak caller with phone number ending in 803. If you can please dial star six to unmute and state your name for the record. If you can spell your name, that would also be helpful. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. John Cavendish, J-O-H-N-C-A-V-E-N-D-I-S-H. And good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us, commissioners and interested parties. I'm calling as I am a resident of downtown Los Angeles. Uh, I've lived in downtown Los Angeles for nearly a decade and have seen what the bids have been able to do for us. I particularly live in the historic core. Now, the bids have been participating in our neighborhood and improving our safety, security, and sanitation uh, for more than a decade beyond when I've been here. And when we're looking at what we have to do, we have to consider a few things. I think part of the reason for this push is further transparency. I saw what a lack of transparency did to our neighborhood when we had a council member who wasn't very transparent and is now looking at a long prison sentence. Because of that, we were without a member on the city council for months during a pandemic and a time when we needed representation most. Uh, however, that being said, the bids are already required to be transparent. I listen to BID board meetings for both my local BID and others to get a little bit more understanding about the process. Uh, these bids are already, uh, they have to comply with the California Public Records Act. They have to comply with the Brown Act. Uh, their meetings must be public. Their, document, their documents must be available to the public. And that's because not only are they a contractor of the city, when we go back, and you'll have to excuse me, my PhD is in economics, it's not a Juris Doctorate, but in looking into this, uh, the reason why the uh, BIDs are applicable to these laws is because they're not only a contractor, they're an agency there of the city. The city created the BIDs just like any other agency. If you refer to the case that brought this along, Epstein versus Hollywood Entertainment District 2 BID. Not just a contractor, an agency thereof, as much as any other department of the city. Now, I understand the nature is different because they are a contractor and they're providing supplemental services. They aren't located in City Hall or another municipal building. But this is why they have to be open and transparent. So when we're looking at what we're trying to require of them, I fail to see how the how much further transparency this would add. Instead, what I see is it bringing bureaucracy. Uh, as one of the previous callers mentioned, not every BID has a budget of $10 million. We have BIDs working in marginalized communities with budgets of several hundred thousand dollars. These BIDs are providing security and sanitation in the middle of a pandemic, and we're considering moving some of that budget away from it to add to bureaucracy in the name of transparency when they're already required to be transparent, as they are, in fact, part of the city. And again, I would ask what other agency thereof is required to register as a lobbyist. Uh, I've heard suggestions that maybe they should be out of punitive action because uh, some people may not like the actors or the actions of a BID, and they are free and fair to criticize. However, if you don't like the actions of the BID, an action is not lobbying. Address those actions, but if we're trying to be punitive, and in doing being punitive, we're taking away security and sanitation from marginalized communities in the middle of a pandemic, I have to ask what we're really, really accomplishing. 
I ask that we take a strong look and really define, and as another caller said, what's the line of demarcation in between ministerial and lobbying activity? It seems to be a little fuzzy, as another caller said. You know, and what's the line of demarcation for the Department of Transportation or for LAPD or for any of these other city agencies? There isn't one. So why is the community, when our property owners have taken it upon them to assess additional money to themselves, why are we deciding at this time to incur extra bureaucracy, to move expenses? These are budgets that are already approved by the city. The great majority of this is going to sanitation and security. So I just question, I don't question what we're trying to achieve. I question if this tactic and measure is correct. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you giving me the chance to have my voice heard and giving me the time to speak. Thank you, Dr. Dedendish. We appreciate your time as well. If we can now hear from caller with phone number ending in 547, phone number ending in 547, if you can please dial star six to unmute and state your name for the record. If you can spell your name, that would be helpful. Thank you. Hi, I missed you, Watsu, M-I-S-T-Y-I-W-A-T-S-U. I am the executive director for the Highland Park and Lincoln Heights bids two of the small and um, marginalized areas in Los Angeles. You've already heard from some of my other colleagues um, regarding the contracts and um, everything else, but I'm going to um, talk a little bit about how Tyler said ministerial. We all got a flyer um, that said bids and lobbying, and the first thing that was on it, it said, I'm a bid employee. I regularly work with this. This is on the part of frequently asked questions. I regularly work with the city officials on projects that provide benefits within the district, such as clean and safe services that are supplemental to similar services provided by the city. Does this mean I am not a lobbyist since I am working with the city? And it says any individual, including a bid employee, may be a lobbyist. Although a bid may provide services that benefit the general public, it is not part of a city government. Under state law, the Bids Owners Association is a private entity that enters into contract with the city. Um, the association should not be considered a public entity, and its members may not be considered city officials for any purpose. Therefore, you meet the definition of a lobbyist. So, to me, that saying, even though we're doing ministerial stress, we still meet the definition of a lobbyist. So, that's why we came together and saying, well, you know, we do clean and safe. Like for us, that's 80% of our budget. Um, and so now you're, it seems like it's kind of walking back. No, those are considered ministerial, but it's stated specifically on your flyer that you published that it is not, it is a lobbyist um, function. So I think, um, as some of my other colleagues said, there's confusion. And um, we need to kind of define what is ministerial. Maybe we need to look at redoing your flyer. Um, but I can tell you for us that our small bids, our two small bids last year had picked up four, over 400,000 pounds of trash. I deal in my bids, 50% of my time is dealing with clean and safe. 25% of my time is dealing with CPRA and Brown Act and other organizational issues. And then the other 25% of my time, I run two farmer's markets, I do grant writing, I do marketing, and I have other programs. So as me, as the only employee for two different bids, I don't see how I'm going to get any resources to be able to dedicate to tracking this lobbying time. So um, any help that you guys could give us would be greatly appreciated, and thank you for listening to me. Ms. Iwatsu, thank you for your call and for expressing your concerns. If we can now hear from caller with phone number ending in 408. Caller with phone number ending in 408, you have the floor. If you can please dial star six to unmute. 
and state your name for the record. If you can spell your name as well, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yes, hi. my name is Peter Clune. My last name is spelled C-L-U-N-E. Um, and yeah, and I'd like to, you know, you know, encourage you to sort of continue to aggressively pursue um, this uh, designation of lobbyists. Um, I think, you know, in a lot of the discussion that's happened today, there's been a lot of sort of sleight of hand going on um, about what the structure of a bid is and what the, you know, quote unquote community it is that they serve. Um, you know, they are legally obligated to serve the property owners in their assessment district. Um, they are accountable to the property owners on their boards. They are not representatives of the broader communities in which they exist. That is just simply by their structure, um, not what they are. Um, and the idea that somehow they are a special organization um, that deserves special treatment and somehow an exemption um, from lobbying um, is, is deeply misguided. Um, and would be a terribly problematic precedent um, for you guys to set. Um, I mean, <clears throat> you know, very specifically, um, just earlier in this call, uh, we heard from from uh, Blair Beston, um, who spoke about sort of you know the Brown Act and the CPRA requests and all the multiple levels of transparency that these bids already claim to provide. Um, and yet, you know, just last year, the bid that she runs was sued for not for not complying with California Public Records Act's request um, and forced to pay tens of thousands of dollars um, for very specifically avoiding those obligations towards transparency um, and accountability that are supposed to be in place. Um, the, the fact of it is that bids here in Los Angeles um, and across the state of California engage in a tremendous amount of lobbying. Um, they engage in lobbying for development projects that directly benefit members of their boards. Um, they engage in lobbying very specifically um, around anti-homeless laws um, to specifically designed to criminalize our unhoused neighbors. Um, there are, you know, you, if you look at, <laughs> if you look at a graph of the rise of business improvement districts, um, since they were established, um, it tracks exactly, it tracks exactly with the rise in anti-homeless criminalization ordinances across the state of California, right? These, these things are not unlinked. These things are directly linked. Um, I would encourage all of you, um, if you have not already had a chance, um, to please read a study that came out of uh, Berkeley Law School um, that documents a lot of the lobbying activity done across the state and also specifically within Los Angeles. Um, <clears throat> you know, in, in 2015, I'm a resident of downtown. Um, the downtown industrial bid was doing, you know, lobbying and advocacy for the city to amend its municipal code um, to sort of preserve the ability to confiscate um, our unhoused neighbors' property um, without proper notice. Um, the um, statewide lot organization over that advocates on behalf of bids has on the statewide level um, opposed a homeless person bills of rights um, and a homeless right to rest act. The, there is a lot of lobbying that happens through these bids. They are, as I said, accountable only to um, their boards. They are deeply undemocratic institutions um, and providing them any sort of special status to evade lobbying restrictions within our city, um, as you know, other cities have already stepped up and said, no, we recognize that these these they are doing political work, they are doing lobbying, they are advocating for the benefits as they are legally obligated for the special benefits of property owners in their district. That's what they do, and yes, they pick up trash, and you know, like yes, they. They do show gaps in city provided services, but simply because they fill those holes should not and cannot exempt them from the lobbying requirements um, for the political work that they are doing and at very explicitly doing and very purposefully doing um, to to affect policy within our city. Um, and they do that in a lot of ways. And, and you need to make sure that um, that they're held to the same standard um, as any other body and not given some sort of, you know, special carve out. Um, thank you very much, uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen. 
Thank you, Mr. Kloon, for taking the time to call in and express your concerns. At this time, we'll be hearing from caller with phone number ending in 062. Caller with phone number ending in 062. If you can please state your name for the record and if you can spell that for us, that would be helpful. Thank you. Sure, my name is Kim Sudhalter. That's spelled S as in Sam, U-D-H-A-L-T-E-R. I handle marketing and community relations for the Melrose Arts District, Business Improvement District. That covers the area along Melrose Ave from Fairfax to Highland. Um, we do not engage in lobbying at all. Um, in my role, I'll just speak to that. Uh, I work with the city on a daily basis. Uh, most of my interactions are with mid-level staff. Um, we assist the city with the tasks that the city is assigned to do. My daily interactions are with um, the LAPD. I speak with our senior lead officer, uh, helping him with issues that are taking place in the district. If you've been watching the news, you have probably seen a lot of uh, crime issues on Melrose lately. And without this public-private partnership, I don't think a lot of the arrests could have been made without the information provided from our business owners and cameras that operate on the street. I also work with the Bureau of Street Lighting on a daily basis. We um, apply for year-long permits for pole banners that identify the business improvement district, string lights, gateway signage, all kinds of other indicators marking the perimeters of the business improvement district. I work with uh, street services and DOT on event permits for um, things like parking day, which takes place across the city, any kind of painting projects we do, LA al fresco dining setups, which have been helping our restaurants. I also help with enforcement of street vending permits and making sure that everybody who's vending on the sidewalks does indeed have a permit and isn't out there illegally. And then finally, I work with council office on a regular basis, um, helping to apply for grants, support for permits, support for enforcement. And um, that is pretty much it. But we uh, feel that the bid is necessary and uh, in providing services that complement what the city does and without a bid and without reporting, um, Melrose would be in a lot worse shape than it is today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sethalsha, for your comments. Thank you for the, taking the time to call in. It looks yep. like we don't have any additional callers with raised hands at the moment. If you would like to speak, please go ahead and dial star nine to virtually raise your hand to speak. In the meantime, I'll be handing it back over to Tyler, who will be providing additional guidance. Tyler. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so we just have a couple of questions. And as I mentioned at the beginning, if anyone would like to weigh in to answer any of these, please just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll call on you and uh, work through. The uh, first question is sort of a multi-part question. So if you'd like me to repeat any of it, please just let me know. But the first is what organizational structure do the bids have? Um, you know, to begin with, we've heard that most of them are 501 C6s, but some of them might be C3s. Uh, so that's the first part. And then the second is, do all of the bids have a governing board and an executive director? And which of those individuals receive compensation? So if anybody'd like to answer those questions, uh, please go ahead. Caller with phone number ending in 791. If you can please dial star six to unmute. And I also wanted to acknowledge that we see raised hands from two other callers, 547 and 599. If you can please wait your turn after caller with phone number ending in 791. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. If you can please state your name for the record. My name is Victor Gonzalez. I'm the director, uh, last name is G-O-N-C-A-L-E-Z. Um, I am the operation directors for the South Park Pit. 
Um, just kind of like, I know most of my colleagues already talked about it. some of the things I was going to talk about, but I'm going to give you guys some examples. Uh, my role as a director of operations is to ensure that our teams deliver essential municipal services to the community every day. That means cleaning sidewalks, curb lines, removing graffiti, stickers, power washing, just keeping up with the maintenance of everything in the district. Uh, we also train our ambassadors to engage with the community with uh, compassion, expertise, and solid judgment. Our team is deployed 24 seven, um, which means we know every alley and street light in the community and numerous community members. Uh, this level of, of expertise make us a, a valuable asset to the department, such as LAPD, DOT, and sanitation, and LA sanitation. And since our establishment over here in 2005, we have developed fantastic work, uh, working relationship with different city entities um, that enable that enable, we enable them to deliver their municipal services more seamlessly. Um, one of the examples I was going to talk about was uh, my Figueroa project. Uh, that, was a, that is a sidewalk enhancement uh, and bicycle infrastructure project that DOT secured federal funding to develop. DOT relied on the bid to communicate with property owners and businesses impacted by the construction and uh, the new street designs. They also handed over the maintenance project to us uh, after completion. For the last five years, I've been in communications over the phone, emails, hundreds of emails, uh, coordinating the handoff of the project. Um, another example, another example on how the city relies on the bids is the civil unrest. Um, I think um, Anthony mentioned that earlier. Uh, LAPD requested the BEDS representatives uh, from downtown neighborhoods um, to assist at their command post. I was actually out there at the time. Um, we were exchanging real-time line communication. We have deployed all, all of our resources here in the district, so we were just communicating back and forth with the with the department. Um, lately, uh, uh, lately, we have a request from the um, council district office uh, to identify and compile all the locations and IDs of the street lights that are not working in the district, and that's something that we're working on right now. So they actually uh, reached out to us and asked us if we could compile everything for them. Um, also, the Department of Transportation paved two uh, streets last year uh, they moved the bike lanes from one side to the other side, and they asked if uh, we could uh, compile all the property contact information uh, for them uh, with the locations and the contact, just the contact information, all the like properties that were going to be affected um, and on the streets. Uh, sanitation is another program that usually reach. They usually reach out to us and ask to submit everything into 311 and then give them their SR numbers uh, so they could follow up with anything that, you know, it's illegal dumping uh, or bulky items that people put out on the streets. Um, as you can see, the city requests and communications from us, it's, um, it's requ it requires us to track and, and it requires us to report and all those communications would be if I if I start kind of like trying to report and track down everything that I actually um, do with the city, it's going to be difficult and impossible, and it would take a lot of time from me um, just putting everything together, and that would also take time from actually the service that I'm you know usually out there um, doing in the community. I know people talked about people talk about like you know, numbers, but I'm just going to give you some, I'm going to just, um, just give you some quick numbers, you know, just to kind of like see what we actually do out there like every week. We track numbers every week. And just as a quick example, you know, we're removing like 15,000 um, square
square foot of graffiti every day. We're picking up we're picking about 50 bulky items every week, and uh, we're collecting 45,000 uh, pounds of trash every week. Those are just numbers that you know. Um, I know the city is not providing to the to the community, so we're out there doing this. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Caller with phone number ending in 547, you have the floor. Please dial star six to unmute. And please state your name for the record. Uh, oh. This is Misty Iwatsu, M-I-S-T-Y-I-W-A-T-S-U. Um, just going back to the questions that were asked, uh, the Lincoln Heights Benefit Association of Los Angeles, the Lincoln Heights bid is a 501c3. The North Figueroa Association, the Highland Park bid, is also a 501c3. Uh, they both have part-time executive directors and uh, a board of directors that meets um, usually monthly. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. Uh, do you mind, as a quick follow-up, do you happen to know if those people are compensated for their work? The executive director, or the board of directors. Uh, either. What? Uh, I, either one. The executive director is compensated. The board of directors are not. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Caller with phone number ending in five nine nine. You have the floor. Please dial star six to unmute and state your name for the record, please. If you Hi, this is spoken, you don't have to spell it, but if you have not spoken, if you can also spell your name for us. Thank you. You got it. Okay. Hi, this is Suzanne Hawley from the Downtown Center Business Improvement District. We are a 501c6. Uh, we are executive director and myself, president and CEO, are compensated. We have a board of directors that is not compensated. Does that answer all of your questions? It does, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Caller with phone number ending in 062. Please dial star six to unmute. You have the floor. And please state your name for the record. This is Kim Sudhalter from the Melrose Bid again, and I wanted to let you know that the Melrose Bid is a 501c3. We have a part-time executive director who is compensated and a board of directors who are not. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that information. Um, the next question is to sort of go back to the conversation we were having about ministerial activity. So, I'd like to know first if you could give us maybe a couple of other examples, some of the things that you do in terms of just connecting your members with city services. I, I know we talked about trash collection and things like that, but if you could just give us some other examples of the types of things like that that you do, and if possible, give us a rough estimate of what percentage of your activity would you say sort of falls into that ministerial category? and who within the bid is actually the person making contact with the city employees. Caller with phone number ending in 147. You have the floor. Please dial star six to unmute and state your name for the record. If you have previously spelled it out, you don't have to do so. Thank you. Hi, caller with phone number ending in 147. It looks like you are unmuted. Please go ahead and state your name for the record and go ahead. Yes, hi, uh, this is Ellen Riotto with the South Park bid. I'm sorry, I had muted myself on my end, the double mute situation. Um, so I think what, what is interesting about that question is just how ubiquitous our communication with the city as it pertains to sort of the day-to-day can be. So for, for example, um, the city attorney's office recently held a couple of uh, seminars that were open to the public 
um, they distributed a flyer. So our communications director was asked to make sure that that communication was shared with the community um, from a from our digital platform perspective. But it was also printed and disseminated to our operations teams who were handing them out uh, physically to um, property managers um, or businesses so they could hang them in their windows. So I think um, that's just one example of sort of the, the not direct services of clean and safe that we are providing, but uh, an assist essentially to um, the city who is using our resources and our infrastructure, if you will, to um, connect and, dis and distribute information to community members. Okay, so great. it would yeah. be hard, I guess, we sorry, actually, you, you, actually had not, you asked about time. Oh, Go ahead. I, I just realized you asked about timing. And when those kinds of things are happening as frequently as they are, um, you know, maybe that one task took my communications director, um, let's say, 20 minutes to load it up to all of our various um, communication channels. Um, you know, I, I would imagine that our operations manager was actually tasked with the printing out of that flyer. So maybe that was an additional 15 minutes. Um, the distribution on the ground, you know, I, I actually wouldn't know how to calculate how long that took to hand out all of those flyers. But as you can see, it's not a simple tallying um, when we're doing when we're doing tasks like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for that example. And just again, to clarify, in that situation, that is not something that we would be asking you to keep track of. That, as far as we're concerned, is not lobbying activity. We are not proposing to make that lobbying activity. So we certainly understand the challenges that it would, you know, you would be faced with in terms of logging all of those interactions. But that's that example that you just gave right there, uh, I think is both a good example of the kind of activity that bids spend a lot of time doing, and also a good example of the type of activity that we are not looking to regulate. So thank you very much for that example. Excuse me, Tyler. I, I do want to just, I guess, ask a follow-up um, then, because as Suzanne mentioned, and I think a couple of other callers have requested, it's clear that we need some further communication um, or clarification, I should say, around what does in fact then fall under the category of lobbying. Um, one example that has recently come up um, that I think is a kind of a perfect test case here is um, we got a request to weigh in on um, the scooter ordinance um, because we are literally providing 24 seven services on the street level, right? And a lot of what we do unfortunately is picking up overturned scooters or putting them in a, in a place that is more accessible and out of the way uh, and not causing safety hazards. So there is a certain amount of time um, that we spend sort of maintaining that public right of way free, of, free and clear of scooters. And so it's the natural, you know, it, it, it makes sense that the city would ask us to weigh in. But, you know, according to the definition that was kind of given earlier, that those comments could be perceived as attempting to sway the de a decision made by the city. So would that be um, acknowledged or, or sort of deemed a lobbying activity if it is information that is, and, and frankly, a perspective that is being solicited from the city because of the role that we serve in the community? Yeah, that's a good question. So. In order for that to be considered lobbying activity, under the existing law, what you basically have to have to become a lobbyist as an individual is to spend 30 or more compensated hours in any consecutive three-month period engaging in lobbying activity. And that has to include a direct communication with the city employee. Um, and it has to be for the purpose of attempting to influence municipal legislation. So. In that case, there is municipal legislation there. For that to be something that is reportable, the person engaging in that interaction would have to not only be compensated, but to be spending 30 or more hours in that three-month span engaging in that kind of activity. So 
all of the ministerial stuff is not adding up to 30 hours. That would just be the kind of activity that is related to influencing municipal legislation. Does that make sense? So the, if, a, if somebody were engaged in day-to-day -day operations that were relating to the ministerial activity and then as a one-off weighed in on the scooter ordinance, that's, there's not 30 hours there. So that person would not be required to register as a lobbyist unless they met the definition independently. Sure, I, I, I hear you. Um, but I mean, that, that activity on my end, by the way, I am logging that based now because of the flyer that was issued last year, um, just to cover all my bases and, and you know, in case. Um, but you're right, that one instance certainly will not amount to 30 hours. Um, but that stuff happens quite frequently, right, where the city is asking us to weigh in. And so that's, I guess that's what doesn't quite sit right in this entire conversation is so often the city is asking for our opinion because they recognize the value that we have. And to then not only ask for that opinion, but also require that we document. And then if that tallies to more than 30 hours, uh, register as lobbyists just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. And you're concerned uh, primarily about being on the receiving end, is that correct? Just we're trying to you know, take stock of everyone's concerns just to make sure that we have them down correctly. And your concern here is that being on the receiving end of the request from the city is not something that you think should qualify you? That's correct. I think if the city is asking for information, data, input, perspective, opinion even, um, that we shouldn't be penalized for providing that opinion. Okay, yeah, got it. Thank you very much. I mean, this is what we're doing this. We're trying to get a full understanding of what you all are concerned with and uh, hearing things like that is exactly what we need to take down and then talk about internally. So thank you for uh, bringing that up. Yeah, of course, thank you. Caller with phone number ending in 599. If you can please dial star six to unmute. And if we can please limit our responses to one to two minutes to allow time for everybody else to speak as well as additional questions. Thank you. Sure, you bet. Um, it's Suzanne Holly. Again, I'll, I'll be brief. So just to, to bring up the you know, LADOT example, um, this is where LADOT reached out to us. They said, we're putting in improvements. We don't have a lot of time to do a lot of community outreach. Will you please reach out to the community for us and connect us with stakeholders who might be impacted by these particular improvements? We do that. And, and in the course of that, there's feedback that comes back that says, you know what, I can't, I can't have that improvement like that. Then I won't have um, a loading uh, lane any, anymore, or I won't have a you know valet anymore. So then, LADOT changes their plans because of that. So you know, similar to what Ellen was just saying, you know, the we are fulfilling our required role, our contractual role. It is written as our in our contract that we are to be a liaison with the community and the city. We are required to do that. Like we can't say no to that. When the city asks us to do that, we can't say no. And then to require us to report it as if it was voluntary activity, as if it's lobbying, that's what seems incongruous to us. Do you mind if I ask just as a process question, when you do solicit feedback from the community and uh, you, you know, let's say you're just sort of collecting that to pass along to DOT. What is your process for actually conveying that to DOT? Is that something that you put in a combined letter and then submit through public comments? Or how is that information relayed to DOT? No, we actually um, connect LADOT with the stakeholders. So uh, it's, we, we have a meeting 
if they have you know something they want to show stakeholders, um, we 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 know who the owners are. We can contact them quickly, and we just facilitate having that meeting, and, and then we will sit in on the meetings with the stakeholders in LADOT. So there's no there's no letter, there's no position, there's I mean it, I mean there's emails going back and forth regarding this, but it's just facilitating that communication between the parties. Gotcha. Okay, great. Yeah, so just to clarify on that point, too, so that also is not lobbying activity. So if you are just putting the meeting together and the people who are within your district are simply attending the meeting and speaking directly to DOT without the bid itself taking the position there, um, that's also something that you would not be required to keep track of just in your role as a facilitator, if that makes sense. Yeah, but I mean, but we would also, you know, provide comment too. I mean, we would we would make sure and convey anything to LADOT as well. So, you know, if uh, I I don't, it it might not be as clear cut, and I'm I'm not sure I'm seeing how it's different than what Ellen was saying, because we would provide, you know, our support to the property owner in conveying their request to the city. Okay, got it. Okay. Thank you okay. very much for the information. Okay. Caller with phone number ending in 816. Please dial star six to unmute and state your name for the record, please. Uh, hi, this is Chris Larson uh, with the Hollywood Partnership again. I was just going to offer one or two more examples of sort of that ongoing iterative ministerial contact with the city. Um, following the, the, the protests that erupted into additional uh, violence and destruction in our community on Saturday night, um, I was not only working with the or, or the master sergeant for the Hollywood division, but then also with the captain on Sunday morning, um, helping to compile an inventory for them to report up to command staff regarding the number of buildings and facades uh, that were damaged and vandalized throughout our district, building that inventory for them. Um, and then also at their request, um, helping to solicit interest from those property owners or managers uh, to file police reports um, and to ultimately press charges against some of the individuals that they arrested. Um, you know, and so I think that that is, um, again, you know, an indication of uh, the very strong partnership that we enjoy with the city. Um, you know, a second example recently that we are working on is um, here in, in CD13. Um, our councilman has um, stood has stood up a vaccination clinic, um, and they have asked us to go door to door um, for uh, qualifying individuals, uh, in particular within the food and beverage industry, um, to ensure that they're aware of it, encourage them to sign up um, to, to get vaccinated, so we can support reopening um, here in our district. Um, and so I, I just go back to this like fundamental relationship that we share with the city, where we are, are truly partners um, in working to protect our community. We are definitely in the flow of things. Um, we are also professionally managed organizations. I myself am a uh, certified urban planner, uh, carry AICP designation uh, with master's degree in public administration. Um, you know, and so we specialize um, in managing these types of places. Um, and um, and really do so really in get, getting back to uh, that notion of partnership for the betterment of our broader communities. Um, and, and that's what really what we're existing to do. Uh, getting to the earlier question about organizational structure, we are organized as a T6. Um, and I think the biggest difference there is it's going to be, you know, the IRS de designation for what qualifies as a, three, a C3 versus a C6. Um, but we do have an interest in standing up a C3 so that we can also bring in tax deduct deductible donations to help to further assist in providing benefits for the community. Things that the city has abandoned doing, like caring for our tree canopy, 
and being able to facilitate public art. Um, I myself am a compensated um, uh, executive director of our board of directors, which is entirely volunteer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Larson. If we can hear from caller with phone number ending in 829, and as a reminder, if we can please limit our responses to two minutes to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to get heard, that we are able to seek input on additional questions that we have for the bid community. So if you can please limit your responses to one to two minutes at most, please. Thank Hello, you. This is Blair. If you can please state your name for the record. Thank you. Hi, it's it's Blair Besson again uh, with the Historic Core bid, and we are a C6 as well with a compensated executive director, and the board is 100% volunteer. Um, I just wanted to echo what Suzanne said about being a community liaison, that it is actually, it, the verbiage is in the contract. And so um, I think that they, the, the city looks to us and the community looks to us for our knowledge and expertise for having been given permission to act in the public realm. We do not have authority. We just have permission. So we still look to the city to be the authority. Um, you know, some of us have even lived in, in I, I've lived in downtown for a long time. So, you know, it's, um, you, your, your look to for your feedback um, and to, be an informational source. So um, if we take a position, a formalized position about a, a piece of legislation, if we were to do that, it's not something that's done independently behind. It would be something that the board would do. We would have to vote on it. So I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. And that actually pretty nicely into our next question. Um, we were wondering, for that sort of activity, um, could you tell us a little bit about your process for deciding what city matters uh, your bid takes a position on? So I, I'm thinking less of the things that the city comes to you about, but let's say there's no initiation on the part of the city. Could you tell us a little bit about how your bid decides what they're going to weigh in on and are all of those decisions made at publicly noticed meetings? And is this done by a public vote? If anybody would like to answer that, if you can please dial star nine to raise your hand. And I do see a raised hand by phone number ending in 547. You have the floor. Please go ahead and dial star six to unmute and state your name for the record. Hi, this is Misty Iwasu. Just to answer that question, um, all of our meetings um, have to comply with the Brown Act. So everybody, it's an open meeting, everybody's welcome. Um, so for us, we had, we have the California High Speed Rail coming through Lincoln Heights. Um, before they adopted the uh, plan, we had asked we were asked by the community, they hadn't heard anything. So we had asked the high speed wheel if they could just keep public comment open for an additional um, 60 days while the community had, gets access. I mean, cause this is during the pandemic, right? So they can't go to the library, they can't look. So why we were able to get the plan out to the community and if they wanted to weigh in, um, they could but all we did was just ask for an extension to give the community a chance to um, weigh in if they wanted to, but at least um, be notified because um, high-speed rail, you know, it's there's 60,000 people in Lincoln Heights and they sent notices to, I believe it was 1,500 people. So um, we just tried to get the word out. So that's our example. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, that is a good example. And we, I can say we love that setup. Uh, directing people to public comment, I think is a great facilitating role. And 
just again to be clear, that's not the type of activity that would trigger, uh, you know, lobbying registration either. So, thank you very much for that example. If anybody else would like to weigh in on that, you can go ahead and dial star nine to raise your hand. And uh, Tyler, if you'd like to go ahead and restate the question or move on to the next one. Sure, yeah. Uh, next question is sort of related to that. And it is when your bid does decide to weigh in on a city matter, um, let's say something that's pending before council or a planning commission, is that typically done through a position letter that is submitted uh, through the council file management system or public comment, or is that conveyed through an in-person meeting or a phone call? And if it is done by letter, is that something that you do submit to the council file, or do you take that letter and send it directly to a city employee? Mr. Larson, you have the floor. If you can dial star six to unmute, go right ahead. Yeah, it is, it is very infrequent for our uh, board to take an official position um, on a, um, a matter of wide jurisdictional influence. Um, however, there have been three matters that we have chimed in on uh, relative to the Hollywood community, and we have really reserved those moments for things that have a direct and localized impact on Hollywood. Um, so about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, um, there were some urban design guidelines that were uh, proposed for Hollywood that uh, did not meet uh, any sufficient definition of public participation, um, including um, not reaching out to local neighborhood, the bid, the chamber, really any of those organizations. And we did vocalize our concern about that because it would have eliminated TOZ, TOC zoning, um, which is um, obviously very important around transportation corridors. Uh, so we drafted a letter. The letter was reviewed and approved by our board um, in, in a public session um, and then submitted through the CRA's uh, public comment uh, portal. Similarly, uh, we recently submitted um, multiple letters regarding the proposed Hollywood Community Plan update, which is a zoning document that, that obviously affects the zoning of the entire Hollywood area. Again, that letter was, um, was considered by my board in public session and submitted uh, through, um, uh, directly through to the Planning Commission uh, via their general uh, web uh, email address. Uh, and then finally, uh, just due to the defund movement, uh, we have had 37 officers um, basically relocated outside of the Hollywood division. Um, and that was a major, major hit to a critical deployment of community-based policing in our district. Um, and we did write a letter that was considered by the board in public session, um, approved by the board, and then submitted directly to uh, the chief of police and Mayor Garcetti. Uh, but those are the three examples in my tenure where our board has, um, has acted in an official capacity uh, to weigh in on a broader city matter. Um, outside of that, uh, we, we do not participate in, in sort of like the general public processes in City Hall. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for that answer. And I really appreciate all the detail. And Ms. Holly, if we can hear from you now, if you can dial star six to unmute, go right ahead. Hi, sure. Um, so just understand a little bit about the, the background, background of the Downtown Center Business Improvement District. Um, until just a few years ago, um, Carol Schatz led the organization, at which time she also led the Central City Association. So um, as, a, as a business improvement district, we, we never had a history of, of you know, I don't want to say never, but I, I am not aware. Uh, of us providing, you know, a letter to the, the, the city council on something that would have been done through the Central City Association. Since I've headed up the organization in, in 2018, um, we have weighed in a couple times um, on ordinances. I believe, you know, one was, was street vending, and it was just been in the form of public comment. 
and it's been um, with regards to just the impact of the the the, the management of street vending would would have on um, on the district, and and maybe I don't think you're hearing from a lot of people because I, I don't think it's it's something that you know we do as a, an industry a lot, um, but for us that's it's limited to things primarily that impact the public space and to public comment at city council meetings. Okay, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the information. Um, the next question is about the assessment. So we were wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how the money that is assessed by the city is distributed. So our understanding is that under the contract, the clerk's office has the authority to reject expenditures that fall outside of the contract. Is that how it actually works in practice? And where the bid is the one spending the money, are the items approved on a case-by-case -case basis, or do you effectively have your entire assessment available to you to spend, and then those expenditures get audited later? So any information you might have about that process would be great. If anyone would like to weigh in on that process, please go ahead and dial star nine to raise your hand. Ms. Iwatsu, I see your raised hand. Please go ahead and dial star six to unmute and you have the floor. Thank you for reminding me to press star six. Um, so we work with the city clerk. Um, we present our budget to them. It actually goes through the city clerk's office several layers. Um, of administration to look over every item. Um, I have met with the city clerk's office, I would say four times in the past month to go over our budget and to make sure in our annual plan and to make sure everything is accounted for. Um, and then once the um, city clerk's um, office approves it on the first layer, then they keep raising it up. And then sometimes it gets get past, kicked back to us because they have more questions. And at that time, then we have another meeting and we go over everything um, until it passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody else want to weigh in on that one before we move on? Ms. Holly, we see your raised hand. Please dial star six to unmute and you have the floor. So, so if I understand, um, the question is, do we have access to the funds all at once to spend? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, we were just sort of curious how in practice the city clerk's oversight kind of works. I mean, is this a thing where you get to decide on the expenditures and then you have to take them to the clerk on a case by case basis, or was just mentioned, you know, maybe you meet with the clerk every other so, month or something like that, or do you sort of have access to it up front? You get to spend it and then it's audited after the fact. So we have to provide an annual planning report each year, which includes our budget for the coming year, and the city clerk then approves that to ensure that it's in alignment with the management plan that was approved by city council. Then the city clerk uh, distributes assessments to us um, as they are received by the county. Um, so we receive them periodically. So we receive the funds, we spend them in accordance with the budget, and then we are required to report on the expenditures on a quarterly basis. There is not an, an expense by expense review and approval process. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for okay. the information. Ms. Riotta, please go ahead and dial star six to unmute. You have the floor. 
Thank you. I just wanted to add quickly, um, and and Missy uh, touched on this a bit, but if ever there is any kind of flag with regard to assessments or invoices, we have to invoice the city of Los Angeles um, if in order to receive our funds. And we are often, I mean, it's not, it's not uncommon to be denied that request if there is some, you know, if a report of ours hasn't been uh, reviewed and accepted by that time, um, the city is, it, it will withhold our funds if we are not hitting other benchmarks that are set up. So, you know, we have to submit quarterly reports to the city, including budget, spend down, et cetera. Um, it's quite a meticulous process and um, other funds that have not yet been received will be withheld until all of those benchmarks are hit. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of checks and balances. <laughs> Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. So it's sort of based on what's happened so far in terms of whether the additional funds are released. Exactly. And if you're not complying, if for whatever reason, you know, for instance, we, um, there were changes to our budget uh, last year because of the pandemic. We weren't able to host any um, events that we would normally do to support our small businesses and um, provide, you know, marketing services, et cetera. And so we had leftover funds that weren't initially accounted for when we set up our budget um, at the end of 2019. And, you know, I had maybe two or three calls with our city clerk rep to make sure that they understood how we would be using those funds alternatively. Um, and I had to submit an update to our report in order to, you know, get their sign off and then have access again to my portal and receive, be able to receive funds. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you very much for that information. Ms. Iwatsu, I see your raised hand. Please go ahead and unmute. You have the floor. Just, just to go back um, to what everybody said, not only do we do quarterly reports in our planning report, but we also have to submit to the city um, reviewed financial statements every year. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have one last question here. Um, just as a general matter, we understand that the bid's position is that it's sort of a unique entity, and I, I think in some ways it is. Um, but from our perspective, when there is a matter that's under consideration by the city, can you tell us why that you feel that the public should not be aware of the interested parties, including bids? that do spend money to influence the outcome. So with our lobbying portal, the public is able to go there and sort of see who the interested parties are who are required to register as lobbyists. So if a bid representative meets that threshold, shouldn't they also be able to be found by the public in the same um, lobbying database that they would be able to find everyone else, even if the meetings are publicly noticed and subject to the Brown Act and that sort of thing. Um, anyone who can give us just sort of your general opinion on that, uh, that would be great. If anybody would like to weigh in on that, you can dial star nine to raise your hand. And again, the question was when there's a matter under consideration by the city, why shouldn't the public be made aware of the interested parties, including bids that spend money to influence the outcome? And that's just to give us a better understanding from your point of view. Please, thank you. Ms. Iwatsu, go ahead, you have the floor. Um, we don't usually engage in those activities, so that's probably why you're not hearing from any of our other bids. Um, that's not what we do, uh, at least in Lincoln Heights and Highland Park. So um, I, I can't speak to other bids, but we don't take positions usually um, on things like that. Okay, thank you for that. Caller with phone number ending in 062. 
If you can please dial star six to unmute and state your name for the record. Hi, this is Kim Sudwalter again. I currently work with the Melrose bid, but I have worked with business improvement districts since 1998. I have a, a firm that freelances with bids for marketing consulting services. I have never encountered one bid and I've worked with pretty much every one of them throughout the city of Los Angeles up to Oxnard and Ventura that has uh, lobbied for a project such as that, never mind spending any money to lobby. So I don't believe that that is something that bids do anywhere. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, oh, it looks like we have uh, one or two more. Uh, you wanna go ahead with that? Is caller with phone number ending in 408. Please go ahead and dial star six to unmute and state your name for the record. Hi, my name is Peter Kloon. I um, actually spoke earlier as well, um, but just wanted to, to chime in here um, as a member of the community unaffiliated with any bids. Um, I know that I would greatly appreciate, um, you know, seeing those sorts of disclosures um, and having that kind of greater insight um, you know, both into the activities um, and, you know, political lobbying that these groups are engaged in. Um, I think, you know, there are, you know, it would it would create a lot more trust, um, especially I think um, where I live in the downtown community, um, in sort of having that insight um, and being able to know sort of who and when and where um, and sort of what's happening. Um, because, you know, without that, um, I think, you know, I'd say especially within downtown, um, there's a certain level of distrust um, about the activities that happen, um, you know, particular meetings with elected officials, um, you know, uh, and, you know, related to various things that have happened in downtown over the past decade, um, everything from, you know, Skid Row Neighborhood Council elections um, and lobbying done by Blair Beston around that, um, and these various different groups and the way they interact, um, you know, having that sort of sunlight on it. Um, would be really helpful. Um, I know I would appreciate it, um, and I know many members of my community would as well. Um, so I'd encourage you to hopefully move forward. Thank you. Ms. Riata, you wanted to add something else. Please go ahead and dial star six to unmute. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just share the South Park bids um, sort of process, if a, if the board ever does take a formal position, which always occurs in one of our public meetings, um, which always has an item agenda for public comment, um, a formal letter will be drafted and submitted as part of the council file. Um, and so that transparency already exists. And so I guess my suggestion is considering all of the other ways in which we've illuminated that bids are different from typical lobbyists or entities that are required to register as lobbyists, you know, perhaps a consideration is um, mandating what I've just said. If the board does take a formal vote that a letter be submitted as a part of the council file um, and, and, and that therefore checks the transparency box, but doesn't require bids to be tracking time um, and going through the um, process of, of registering as a lobbyist. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And I just wanted to say about that last point in particular that the um, 2018 recommendations that were discussed at the Ethics Commission's December meeting actually do include an exemption to what counts as a direct communication for items that are submitted through the public comment process. So in that example that you just gave, uh, that actually would be exempted and would not trigger qualification if that were the direct contact that would qualify a person as a lobbyist. So um, that's a great suggestion. And I think that was part of our consideration when we were going through this the last time around. But just wanted to put that out there that that is in the 2018 recommendations that we discussed at our December meeting and that are currently available on our website. So thank you very much for that uh, comment. Right. That concludes the Q&A portion of this meeting. Tyler, if you'd like to go ahead and add anything in conclusion. 
Sure. Yeah. Just again, we want to say thank you to everyone who showed up for this today. Um, I know we're going on two hours now, so we really appreciate you sticking around um, when answering our questions. You can reach us absolutely anytime. If you want to shoot us an email, if you want to give me a call, uh, please do if you have any specific questions. Um, we're always here to help out in whatever way we can. Again, we really appreciate you taking the time and anything from us. Do not hesitate to reach out and uh, we hope to talk to you soon. Thanks, Tyler. And if I can just add uh, our website has a form that is specifically for taking additional public comments about this matter at ethics.lacity.org slash policy. You can go ahead and submit additional public comments online via that site. And other than that, thank you so much for taking the time to voice your concerns, to speak on behalf of your communities. And that concludes this interested persons meeting. Thank you. The recording has stopped.